Hey guys, welcome to episode 15 of the House of Williams. So in today's episode, we've got quite a lot to get through. We're going to be ringing some chicks on the commoner side of things um, from our yellow rum pairing. We've got five little ones there that are due to be rum. And then in terms of the educational side, we're going to be discussing what to do if you're losing birds, if you've got some sick birds in your bird room, um, and sort of what are some of the telltale signs and what I do uh, from my own experience, what I've found works for me. Um, and then the sort of final part of the show is we're going to be discussing, or part of the show, not the final part, but part of the show is we're also going to be discussing our majestic bloodline in terms of some of the pairings and, and some of the revisions we're going to make in terms of those pairings um, to see if we can improve the second half of the season on that side of the bird room. So in terms of the majestic side of things today, we will, well, if you're listening to the introduction, you'll know that we sort of re some repairings. So that comes about where I feel that two birds have not hit it off for whatever reason, much like an arranged marriage, they don't always work out, and or normal marriages, never mind arranged marriages. Um, and it's then better to sort of instead of losing the whole season to maybe do a bit of a shuffle around and see if you then can't, can't do a better pairing. Um, it's the one thing where Avery breeding has a definite advantage over box cage breeding. So in an Avery scenario, the pairs choose their, their, their own partners, if you like. Um, and as a result, you tend to have a greater level of success in terms of your breeding results. Box cage breeding like this, your results are a little bit lower because you might pair uh, two birds together that just aren't compatible for whatever reason, like humans, they might not like the way he serenades her in terms of singing, you might not, she, they might not like the look of each other. We really don't know what goes on in their minds, but I would imagine like people, they have their preferences. Um, so in terms of majestic bloodline, we've got a bit of a divorce happening. And what I did there is I took then um, Egbert, from, which had uh, successfully fold eggs for us, um, but they never raised the chicks. Um, and they have, in terms of breeding, I don't want them to go additional rounds. Um, so what I'm doing is I'm taking him out so that I don't put more pressure on the hen. And I'm putting him in with Elizabeth. Elizabeth and him, well, I've put them together already now quickly this morning. And already I can see that they've hit it off immediately. He's singing for her. She's shaking her tail where she wasn't doing that with George. So already I can see the hen is far more interested in this particular cock bird. Um, and therefore, with her being a second year, I'm hoping that the second half of the season they will um, breed successfully for us. The cock bird had only thrown the first set of youngsters. The second pairing, he had attempted to feed them, but they still weren't successful. So I'm hoping with her being a second year bird, that they will then get that right, and we'll have some successes in terms of our red headed purple breasted for the majestic side of it. So that's kind of the thinking there. Now, that, like I said, is the disadvantage of box cage breeding in that, you sometimes put two birds together that, that don't like each other. But it's got its advantages in that you can control your genetic outcomes and you can, from both a show standard perspective and from a um, mutations perspective or, or color perspective, so that you can get to choose what your outcome is going to be. So it's the price you pay for having that ability to control the situation. Now that's not to say you can't breed good quality birds in an aviary. Um, I have a good friend of mine, he breeds only in an aviary setup. Um, he does have one or two box cages just for sort of speciality breeding, but 90% of his birds is, is aviary bred, uh, whether it be his Bengalese, his zebras, his Javas, or his Gordians. And the thing with, with the way you do that scenario is yes you can't control your individual pairs because they're choosing their own partners but you then take a large portion of the birds out each year that aren't good quality um, and as a result you can improve your quality over the years so what i used to do when i was still avery breeding um, i would 
take out 50% of my hens, so the worst quality hens in terms of show standard, and the worst quality cockbirds in terms of show standard. I would then add a couple of additional birds that have come from other breeders that I know are not related, so I'm adding new blood every year. And that's the way I would improve the quality of the birds that I was producing in terms of the show bench. But you still don't have a control in terms of the genetic outcome. So it's a bit of a lucky draw. Are you going to get a lot of yellow birds this year? Um, are your head colours going to mix and give you the wrong um, sort of outcome that we spoke about previously? Um, or, you know, he was lucky enough, uh, that friend of mine, to randomly get some blues coming out. Um, and it just so he doesn't have any bluebirds in his aviary, but he happened to get two spitful bluebirds that paired up. And that's how he got his blues. So, yeah, aviary breeding's got its advantages, but its disadvantages as well. And the same with the box cages. Um, the advantage being you've got control, but the disadvantage is that sometimes your breeding successes aren't as high as if you do aviary breeding. All right, so that's the majestic side of the show. We're now going to move on to ringing some birds on the commoner side. So we've got five yellow rumps um, that we're going to be ringing this morning. Right, so uh, like I said, we've got five yellow rumps that we're going to be ringing today. So the, uh, well, not all of them are yellow rumps, but from the yellow rump pair. So the first thing that I do when ringing is I'll hook that big toe. Uh, as you can see me doing there. It is a little bit tricky. Once I've got that through, I'll bring the other two toes up that I'm holding between my thumb and forefinger. And then I'll gently grab the front toe and pull the ring backwards over the foot. I'm putting virtually no pressure on the toes themselves because I don't want to damage them. Because remember, those bones are tiny, they're not even the thickness of a needle. So you don't want to be twisting and bending the toes at all. You want to pull the ring over the foot, not, not the foot through the ring, if that makes sense. And then once it's past the base of the foot, you'll see the back toe naturally bends backwards. You just need to gently pull that back toe forward and out as you sliding the, the ring as far back as possible. And that's uh, the first one done. So what I wanted to show you as well is here's two chicks. One of them is a yellow rump. You can see the yellow feathering on the rump straight away versus the normal colouring, which is the, the blue feathering. So the yellow rump gene, you can tell from when the chicks first start getting feathers, um, which is yellow rump chicks and which is normal. So this particular guy, he's a little bit on the big side, so I'm probably not going to get the ring on. Uh, sorry that the the, sh the sort of shot was a little bit to the, the right and you can't see that well. Um, so you'll see uh, the toes go through no problem, but then it gets to the base of the foot and you'll see better now as I move it to the center, but you'll see the ring just doesn't want to go over the base of the foot. So essentially it's too late to ring this baby and if I had to force that ring over now I'm going to damage the bird's foot which is obviously the last thing we want to do. So unfortunately it's just one of those things. Um, this will be an unrung bird. Um, for breeding purposes I don't generally keep any unrung birds. It would have to be a real exceptional youngster for me to keep it. So I'd send that bird to the pet store um, without a ring on it. Here's another yellow rump baby. You'll see the color of the rump is very light. It's the skin hasn't darkened. Okay, this is a bit of a smaller chick, so the feathers haven't really come out yet, but already you can see that it's not a normal um, bird. Yeah, you can see the ring sliding over the back toe again. Once it's past the back th nail, then I'll gently um, pull the ring back and, and the toe out. And there you go, it pops out. I, you'll notice I also just double check that the, the movement's correct, that the bird is closing its foot properly, that I haven't damaged it in any way. Uh. Right, so the next part of the show today, we said that we were going to be talking about what to do if you find that you're starting to lose birds or you have sick birds. So... For me, one of the most important things that you can do for your birds immediately to try and save a sickly bird is to put it on heat 
So typically we use hospital cage for that, something like this one from Nifty Nest, but it, it can be anything where it's an enclosed environment where the bird feels safe, so it mustn't be open, and it has a heat source. You ideally need a thermostat um, that can control the temperature between 29 and 32 degrees centigrade or 85 and 90 degrees Fahrenheit. But that's the kind of temperature range that you want to keep it in. And the reason for that is that a sick finch in particular, they've got such a high metabolism that their little bodies are not eating because they're not feeding well. And you'll find that they start getting quite cold as they're not able to regulate their body temperature because they're just not eating enough and their bodies are fighting the disease. So it makes a difference by putting it in the hospital cage because then at least their body temperature is kept sort of constant and they're better able to sort of focus their energies on, on dealing with the problem at hand. Um, the other thing that and we'll go into more detail as we go through things to look out for in terms of trying to identify what's wrong with it. But one of the things that I found makes a huge difference in terms of trying to stop the losses from happening is I immediately stop all soft food. So egg food, greens, I go purely dry seed and then I make sure to, I mean my room's always getting clean in terms of bowls and that kind of thing, but I'll immediately scrub down all water dishes, food dishes, that kind of thing, so that there's no chance of any contamination um, in terms of fungal or bacterial infections, that kind of thing coming through those meats. You can take it a step further and then for that period while you're trying to sort out what's going on is also switch to bottled water. Um, and the advantage being there is that you eliminate possible uh, water contamination sources. Tap water is often a source of, of problems, um, depending obviously on what part of the world you live in, but yeah, it can be, can be the source of your problem. Right, so I said here I remove the soft food and the greens. And the reason I do that is that, for example, if you're feeding fresh pannikin, you might find that you've brought contaminants into the room when you pick them, in that maybe if it's been raining or there's been a lot of wild bird activity around your pannikin bush, they might actually be bringing, you might be bringing it in, should I say, through that source into your bird room. So I prefer then to switch to dry seed and give the birds a chance to sort of recover from that. The other reason why I say that is that often, our soft food, we out at work all day and we don't have the time to change it when it starts to sour. And the problem with particularly the proteins is that it grows mold and funguses quite quickly. Um, and you can actually be essentially causing your own illnesses through that source. So by removing that, you're taking away a very high possible source of um, contamination in terms of either fungus, mold, or, or even bacterial. So yeah, I remove those straight away and then add the heat, like I said. The next sort of critical part of trying to get the birds well again and, and get things back on track is to try and pick up what is actually the problem. So if we start with breathing, so if you've seen that the bird's breathing is labored or it seems to be gasping, Typically, there's a couple of causes for that. So ASAP mite and guldians is particularly prevalent. Um, so if you're hearing a clicking sound, um, that's generally would be an indication of ASAP mite. Fortunately, that's very treatable if you're using the right sort of mite medicine. I know a lot of the guys use the one that goes on the back of the neck. Um, personally, I prefer something that they ingest through their drinking water that kills the mites from the inside out, so in other words, through the blood. Um, because all mites are parasitic, so they would feed on the blood, so if you're poisoning them through the blood, you know that you're going to eliminate them. Um, and don't forget, obviously, your 14-day follow-up if you are um, treating for a mite infestation. The other sort of two breathing possibilities, or probable breathing, breathing possibilities, in terms of illness, would be a fungal infection. Um, so that's normally through contaminated food or dirty bowls, um, dirty cages, that kind of thing. So your cleanliness is probably um, letting you down there or your soft food is, has become contaminated. And then the other sort of thing that tends to cause gasping is canker. Um, yeah, the technical uh, name we won't worry about at this stage, but it's commonly known as canker. I'll put the technical names on the screen. I don't pretend to be able to pronounce some of them. But 
that you'll pick up as it forms like nodules or a cheese like growth um, in the, the sort of throat and, and crop areas. So yeah, I, um, you can pick that up as well fairly easily. And once again, it's something that can be treated. There's various medicines on the market to sort that problem out. So those are the most common three breathing issues. I'm not saying they're the only ones, but they're typically the ones that are most likely to be your problem. The next source of, of concern is typically around the rear end of the bird which is a vent and typically what I mean by that is that the bird suffering from diarrhea or a blockage or something along those lines. So in terms of the diarrhea side there's a couple of different causes. Bacterial is one of them, so E. coli, salmonella, that kind of stuff. Um, and that's typically more the water side of it. That's why I said switch to bottled or purified water if you suspect that your water could be a problem. Um, and then the other sources is bad food once again, so moldy or, or um, bad food. And then the other one is, and it's something that a lot of people forget about, is that if you're overdoing the protein, if the food's too rich, just like you or me, if we have a very rich meal, uh, we inclined to get diarrhea, the same situation applies for the bird. So yeah, I know a lot of the guys get excited around the breeding season and they're trying to get the birds into condition. Um, but if you, you know, suddenly giving this heavily rich diet um, from a seed only diet, you can expect the birds to, to possibly suffer from diarrhea. So it's something to, to sort of take into account and the way to identify diarrhea is to watch what's happening with the stools of the birds and then also look for a soiled vent. Um, those are the sort of typical signs there. The other thing is I said blockages, um, so particularly in egg laying hens, um, they can suffer from egg binding. Now egg binding, the best thing you can do is the heat that, we put, uh, that I mentioned earlier. Um, because that will help, um, you know, hens typically, if your birds are breeding deep into winter, that's when you would typically have more egg binding issues. But egg binding is actually due mainly to a lack of calcium. So the other thing that you need to do for that hen is to put her on a liquid calcium as quickly as possible. So typically in the drinking water is the best. Um, so either water soluble um, powder form or a, a, in South Africa we get one called Kelsey Bird which is a liquid form. Um, and those would go a long way to solving that problem. The biggest thing with egg binding is, is that that egg shell hasn't actually formed properly. So the sort of contractions of the muscles pushing the egg down the tract uh, to the vent um, is where the problem comes in because the muscles are sort of squeezing the egg down but it's just compressing, it's not actually moving um, anywhere. So that's typically the cause of the egg binding um, and generally speaking your first year hens are particularly susceptible to that but if you haven't prepared your hens properly leading up to the breeding season you're going to have the same kind of issue. Um, fortunately, I haven't had an egg binding issue in a long time because my birds are, are always getting eggshells um, as part of their diet. So I don't generally feed medicated calcium and such unless I've got a problem with an egg bound hen. But in terms of eggshells, my birds always have eggshells, cuttlefish, grit, um, as you've seen in a previous video. So that's very, very important. Um, the next sort of things to look for is uh, sort of injuries. Uh, that will often cause a bird to be fluffed up and unhappy. Um, that can happen from your normal wire cages. I've had it before, particularly when I joined these cages in the flights. At first, I left a bit of a gap, not thinking about it. And what was happening is it was forming a bit of a V-shape. So the bird would get its foot there, it would slide down, and now the toe can't come out, and now the bird's stuck. Um, and then they twist their legs and, and break legs and all sorts of things. Uh, the other one is particularly if you walk in in the morning and suddenly you've got a bird that's not looking well, it may have got a night fright and then they've hit their head sort of flying into the bars in panic. Um, and that's typically why we look at having some kind of night light in the bird rooms or in the aviaries so that the birds can at least see where the edge of the, the cage is and they don't actually crash into it. So yeah, um, but basically, once again, injuries, the best thing you can do for the bird is give it heat and then um, a general antibiotic, a mild one that will just stop sort of any infection um, from 
you know, any abrasion or cut that the bird may have picked up in the process of injuring itself. Uh, and then the other thing that will often make birds sort of ill, if you like, is parasitic infestations. Now, this can be in various forms. So if you haven't dewormed your birds sort of regularly throughout the season and, the, and year, then they could be suffering from a worm infestation. Um, and the other common one is obviously other types of mite besides air sac mites. So, yeah, uh, scaly feet and beak. Um, you'll typically pick up that scaly feet and, and beaks quite easily just by looking at your birds. You'll see the, the beaks and their feet are no longer neat. They tend to get elongated in the gulden, so they form almost like a tube. Um, I've seen that quite regularly and, and unfortunately on the show bench as well where the keepers just haven't realised that their birds actually have a mite infestation. And then also scaly feet and particularly you'll notice that around the ring on, on the bird's leg um, you'll pick it up straight away because you'll see that the leg's swollen um, and that ring is not moving freely and that's all because of the, the inflammation around where the mites are actually um, burrowing into the skin if you like. So. Yeah, very important to, to make sure that you're regularly doing your parasitic um, preventions. Um, I typically do mine at least twice a year unless I suspect there's a problem and then I'll do it more regularly. Uh, but yeah, generally I find before and after the breeding season is, is pretty much ample. I haven't really had any issues um, doing it that way. And then, um, yeah, just general sort of well-being of the birds. What I like to do as well is, and this is a tip I give to our club members, um, and uh, perhaps it's a, a little secret that I've picked up that will be useful to you, but I stopped feeding my protein in my soft food with my vegetable mix. And the reason why I did that is if you think about it, protein tends to go moldy or grow fungus pretty quickly. If you leave a... Um, a tub of chicken or something like that in the fridge for a couple of days you'll find when you open it up it's already grown mold and that's in a fridge where it's cool now you can imagine in a normal room temperature so 20 degrees whatever it is that your bird room is at and now you've got this protein that's moist it's more likely to sour and and grow fungus and mold so i like to keep it separate because i feed a dried commercial egg food i don't boil eggs myself it's dry so there's no chance of it in that form growing mold or fungus so I can literally leave it until the bowl's empty and then refill it and I don't have to worry so I've got zero chance of can well not zero but minimal chance of contamination from that side your greens is your source of moisture so if you think about it your vegetables and that kind of thing um, if you have to put them in a closed bowl and in the heat it would sweat and you would get that moisture build up. Now that's what's going into your protein. By separating the two, you're now removing that source of moisture. And if you had to take a plate of vegetables and in your bird bowl it would be open, it's not a sealed container, and you had to just take that plate of vegetable like grated carrots, peels and that, and leave it out on your kitchen counter, you'll find that the next morning it's dried out. And that's typically what happens with vegetable matter. So by separating the two, I'm not saying you can't get molds and funguses forming, but I found that my, um, shall we say, the frequency of me having sick birds and um, illnesses in my bird room has drastically fallen. If I get one, two birds a year that get sick, um, it's a lot. They normally die from sort of old age, that kind of thing now. Whereas when I was combining my proteins and my vegetable matter and my sprouted seed, I found that I was losing a lot more birds. So that's made a massive difference to me. And I would strongly encourage you con to consider separating the two and see if it makes a difference for you. Um, the other thing to be particularly careful about is sprouted seed is fantastic for getting birds into condition and for raising young. But it's also probably one of your most common sources of contaminants. Because essentially you're germinating those seeds, um, You'll know that if you leave that moist seed um, and you don't strain it properly, it very quickly develops mold. And if you're not rinsing it properly. So products like Safe Sprout and, and other sort of sprouting um, commercial products help. But it's still a risk. So if you have sick birds, please 
first thing you do is take away any um, sprouts of seeds that you might be giving and, and protein and that kind of thing and take all of that away give them a couple of days if the problem goes away you know that you have a contaminant and then you need to look at the hygiene around your prepared foods um, and that's nine times out of ten where your problem is coming from um, yeah these are just some of the tips that are I thought I'd share with you today and really it's made a huge difference in terms of the number of losses. Also just another big tip is if you are treating with any kind of medications, antibiotics in particular, like human beings you're destroying the, the good flora um, or bacteria in the, the gut and you need to replace that. So I always give a uh, probiotic after I've given an antibiotic. And that I'll typically put on the soft food so that I know the birds are getting that good bacteria back into their system. And, and that really does make a big difference. Otherwise, what you will typically find happens is your birds are sick, so you treat them and the, and the sort of illness, if you like, declines and they start looking a lot happier and healthier. You take them out of the hospital cage, you put them back in their normal cage and within a day or two you see that they're starting to look ill again. So it's back in the hospital cage and the cycle just continues until eventually you lose the bird. By putting it <clears throat> on probiotics, you'll find it will then stay healthy. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, I mean, obviously I'm not a vet, so... I'm not saying to you, if you've got a problem in your bird room, don't take it to the vet. I'm saying do definitely take it if you can't figure out what's going on. But these key points that I've given you, separating your soft food, at least your greens from your proteins, giving heat, all those things and removing your soft food completely if you've got a sick bird, will all buy you time to figure out what the problem is and if you're not in a position to figure out what the problem is it'll buy you time to get your bird to the vet where a professional can then diagnose the problem and give you the appropriate medication to get your birds well again so yeah i hope you've helped you found that helpful and uh, yeah we'll see you in a couple of weeks time